We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, today I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Bertram Pitt, uh, f professor of medicine at uh, University of Michigan, who's become a very good friend over the past couple years working on a number of projects together. Uh, but really just wanted to highlight how excited we are to have you today. Uh, amazing career looking back at the development of aldosterone antagonists for treatment of heart failure and really played an influential role in that from the very beginning with the RAILS study. Uh, improved our care for our patients. Uh, and just been a fantastic mentor for many of the fellows. Uh, so it's with great pleasure today that we have you uh, visiting again and giving us an excellent talk, I'm sure, on uh, aldosterone antagonists. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here, and I look forward to this because we're working with Rob and Chris and uh, a new project where we're hoping at least to uh, compare torsamide to furosemide in about 8,000 patients with heart failure. Uh, with the belief that torsamide is much better, but ferrosamide is still the diuretic that's being used. But today I'd like to sort of uh, look at mineral cortic receptor antagonists. Yesterday at the cardiology rounds, I went backwards and gave some of the pathophysiologic background for why we believe that mineral cortic receptor antagonists are useful in both heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and preserved ejection fraction. And today I'd like to go a little forward and tell you where we're going and where we hope to go, at least in some uh, aspects of mineral cortical receptor antagonism. Let's see, I can sit down over here. So I think everyone is familiar with some kind of a scheme like this where activation of the renin angiotensin system and especially if you have angiotensin II, uh, this doesn't uh, project very well, and uh, activation of the AT1 receptor and stimulation then of the release of aldosterone and activation of the mineral cortical receptors. We all learned in medical school that had something to do with sodium retention and volume, uh, but it's become far more complicated. There are mineral cortical receptors in the brain, the vessels, the kidney, and they have a tremendous effect on uh, immune systems, inflammation, fibrosis, free radical production, nitric oxide availability. And I think you're all familiar with some of the trials that we've done in systolic heart failure, beginning with the RALS trial and severe heart failure, stopped early with a 30% reduction in total mortality. Uh, the Ephesus trial with heart failure post-infarction stopped early with a 15% reduction in total mortality. And the Emphasis trial uh, also stopped early, a reduction not only in total mortality but total hospitalizations. So, and then just more recently, the uh, TopCat trial, which the primary endpoint was negative, but if you look at the Americas where we had half the patients, highly positive in uh, Russia and uh, Republic of Georgia, where the half the patients came, had no risk, we had no benefit, but in the Americas, we have a significant reduction in uh, cardiovascular mortality, heart failure hospitalization, and almost reached total mortality with half the patients. Why we had those geographic differences, we're still not sure, but I have my suspicions, and we'll find out maybe in the next year or so why. But in any case, there's clear evidence for a role of mineral cortic receptor antagonists in patients with systolic heart failure, and they've had a pretty dramatic effect over the years on mortality and are now a class one indication uh, pretty much throughout the world. Now, part of the difficulty has been the fear of hyperkalemia, and this is the publication from Juralink. After we did the RALS trial, they noted that there was a significant increase in hospitalizations due to hyperkalemia, and that scared many people in the world uh, and got them very nervous. And when you look at that trial, you find out, yes, they uh, gave a mineral cortical receptor antagonist, but often they gave much higher doses than were used of spironolactone. RALS was done with 25 to 50 milligrams. So often they were using 100, but more importantly, they were giving it to people who were much older than we included in the trial and had worse renal function. And most importantly, many of the patients never had a single measurement of potassium 
And if you're not willing to measure potassium and renal function beforehand and follow it afterwards, uh, then you shouldn't be going there. But nevertheless, uh, this has led to some concern and our concern too. And we've tried to figure out ways where we could make mineral corticoreceptor antagonists a lot more safer and useful. And obviously, there's a great fear of hyperkalemia, and certainly you can die. Though I must say, in the several thousand patients that we've given a mineral cortic receptor antagonist, either spiro or a plerinone, in our trials, we've not had a single death attributable to hyperkalemia. But nevertheless, that's frightened people, and if you look in people with chronic heart failure, this is from a few years ago, of eligible people who had a class one indication, only about 34% were getting an MRA. Uh, it's now a little better. I suspect it's somewhere around 50 to 60%. And if you look post-infarction, at this time it was only about 10%. And just a recent article just appeared in the last few weeks showing post-infarction heart failure in people who were eligible about 14.5% are getting it. So there's another 85% who are not getting it, who are eligible, who could have a reduction in total mortality and total hospitalizations, uh, mainly, I believe, from the fear of hyperkalemia. Now, uh, one of the ways we're approaching this is looking at new mineral cortical receptor antagonists, and we've been working with some new non-steroidal, and the one we've been working with is BAY948862, which has now been called finerenone, and uh, it is very selective for the mineral cortical receptor, uh, as if selective as spironolact, as, if, as tightly bound, I should say, and it is as selective as a plerinone. Spiro is very tightly bound to the receptor, but it's not very selective. It also activates prostagen and androgen receptors, and that's why you get gynecomastia, breast pain, and menstrual irregularities. Uh, and a plerinone is very selective. You don't get that, but it has less affinity, and for a milligram to milligram, about 25 milligrams of spiro is equal to about 50 milligrams of a plerinone. Now, this new non-steroidal uh, finerenone has the same affinity as spironolactone for the receptor and the same selectivity as a plerinone, and therefore we don't get gynecomastia and things like that. But more importantly, when you look at the distribution of, well, didn't come out. Yeah, as you look at the distribution of spironolactone and a plerinone, they go about tenfold to the kidney and about onefold to the heart. And the new non-steroidal, at least the one we're working with, goes 50-50. So you have relatively greater cardiac protection than you have renal. And I think the hypothesis is, and in animal experiments at least, uh, you have less hyperkalemia because you're getting more cardiac relative to renal effects. And we have had the opportunity of looking at this in a phase two pilot trial called ARTS, which we published last year in the European Heart Journal. And essentially, this is a phase two trial where we took uh, various doses of this new non-steroidal, and we compared it to placebo and to spironolactone. And the bottom line was we found that it was very well tolerated, uh, and we reduced BNP and NT pro BNP and we, as well as albinuria uh, greater than placebo, uh, but certainly as much as spironolactone, 25 to 50 a day. And we had hyperkalemia, but we had less hyperkalemia than you had with spironolactone. And the one negative part was, is it didn't reduce blood pressure very well. Spironolactone did a much better job even though we did just as good, if not better, in reducing BNP and albinuria. And that may be because uh, this new compound doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, and a lot of the antihypertensive effects comes from central MR activation, whereas spiro and a plerinone cross moderately. That may not be true, as 
the right explanation, but that's the explanation we have at the moment. So in any case, uh, this looks promising in that it, for heart failure at least, uh, we're getting reductions in BNP and kidney protection, uh, but we're not getting as much hyperkalemia. And so we're now involved in another phase two trial, ARTS heart failure, where we're comparing in people with heart failure and renal disease, that I should say that in the first ARTS trial, everyone had a GFR less than 60 and above 30, as well as heart failure. And that's the same entry criteria here. We're taking people who have a heart failure, systolic heart failure, a GFR between 60 and 30, and they're being randomized to placebo with, once again, various doses of this new non-steroidal. And the comparator this time is a plerinone, whereas last time we used the comparator of uh, spironolactone. We've already randomized, uh, I think, close to 200 patients. We have several more hundred uh, to go. There's a parallel study that's being run in people with diabetic uh, nephropathy that George Backris and Louis Rilopi are running, and uh, that is also in the midst of recruiting. And the plan is, if we can show this has some benefit uh, in comparison to a plerinone, there'll be two large-scale outcome trials, one in heart failure and renal disease, and one in diabetic nephropathy, looking at cardiovascular mortality and outcomes. Uh, but they want to be reassured that there is some commercial advantage before they invest several hundred million dollars in these large-scale trials. But in any case, it looks uh, promising. There are other non-steroidal uh, mineral corticoreceptor antagonists that are being developed, but this is the one most advanced and uh, looks uh, promising. The reason why we're excited about this is one, because it looks like it has some advantages, but uh, spironolactone has been generic for 40, 50 years, and no one is investing in that. A plerinone has been generic for the last year or two, and Pfizer refuses to invest a penny more. And uh, so without any pharmaceutical support, it's very hard to get funding to go and to do further research, and we think there's tremendous opportunity for further research in mineral cortic receptor antagonists, but the only place we can go is to the NIH. We've just been there with TopCat, and it's hard to go back and get them to do more things. So someone with a long patent, or a few companies with a patent, really provides an opportunity for the future uh, to explore mineral cortic receptor antagonists. Now, with some of my colleagues, uh, we've developed uh, another approach to uh, reduce hyperkalemia. And what we've done is taken a polymer and linked it to a small molecule, and we've linked that to a plerinone. This is a plerinone, uh, and we've linked this to this polymer. And this linking molecule, it doesn't light up very well, has a fluorescent marker so we can tell where it is. And this complex, the polymer and the linking molecule of plerinone, go only to activated macrophages. So normal macrophages they don't touch. They go only to activated macrophages. And we have a model of heart failure. And in this model of heart failure, if you occlude the aorta and get hypertrophy and then failure, uh, and you look here at collagen formation, uh, you can see there's an increase, this doesn't shine, there's an increase in collagen formation. When you give normal aplerinone, the usual aplerinone, you have a reduction, but when you give this new complex that only goes to activated macrophages, you completely turn off collagen formation, and you completely turn off fibrosis, and we looked at oxidative stress, we completely turn off oxidative stress much better than the uh, usual aplerinone. And part of the reason for that is when you look at the distribution, I told you that spironolactone and aplerinone go tenfold to the kidney, one fold to the heart, and this is the, in the black bars, is the usual uh, aplerinone, so it's going about tenfold to the kidney, one fold to the heart, and this is our new complex, which goes more than tenfold to the heart and one fold to the kidney. 
So we have a very cardiac specific uh, delivery because in our model, once you have heart failure, the activated macrophages are in the heart failure. If we had concomitant renal disease, it would also go to the kidney because activated macrophages will go there, but those macrophages would be in the interstitium and not in the epithelial cells where you get hyperkalemia. So we haven't explored that, but the hypothesis is that we could both get protective effects in the heart as well as the kidney without getting any hyperkalemia. Now we're still early in animal models. We haven't been in man. It's a long jump from here to there, but we're very excited about this. And not only can we bind a plerinone in this, uh, there are many other molecules. We've already put methotrexate, we put uh, Tempol, which is an antioxidant, and an HDAC inhibitor, and we know we can put many other molecules on this platform. Not every molecule, but if they have an O or an OH group, we can do it. So we're uh, very busily trying to develop this as a platform uh, for site-specific drug delivery. And we've been in contact with several large pharma companies and talking about this, but uh, we'll see where it goes. But in any case, it holds the promise for getting mineral cortic receptor antagonism without hyperkalemia and also getting renal protection, but there's a long way to go. Now, another approach we've taken is using an orally uh, available polymer that goes into the gut and pulls potassium out of the blood into the gut. And this is uh, called RLY5016, the new name for it is patronoma. And uh, you swallow this about two times a day, 10 grams twice a day, and it just pulls the, the potassium out of the blood. Now, about two or three years ago, we had the opportunity of doing the first uh, phase two trial with this, the Pearl HF study, where we took people with systolic heart failure who were on an ACE or an ARB and a beta blocker, and either they had renal disease or they had a history of hyperkalemia due to the fact that they were on a RAS inhibitor or a beta blocker and no longer tolerated it and they had a potassium between 4.3 and 5.1. And we took these people and we forced titrated spironolactone 25 to 50, and we randomized these patients to be on placebo or to have the polymer, and we looked at the changes in potassium. And what we found uh, overall, we had a significant reduction in the yellow in the instance of hyperkalemia, but if you look at the subset who had a GFR less than 60, and they greater than 30, the placebo group had hyperkalemia defined as a potassium of above 5.5 in 39% versus uh, 7% uh, in those who got the polymer. So uh, this has uh, led to some further trials, and there's just been a phase three trial that has just been uh, completed in the last month, presented uh, November at the Society of Nuclear of uh, Nephrology. And uh, people, when we did this first trial, we took people that had normal K and we forced titrated spiro. We went to the FDA and the FDA said, well, uh, we don't really want you to prevent hyperkalemia. If you do that, you can do it, but you'll have to do large outcome trials. So we suggest to you that you treat hyperkalemia, and the company listened very carefully. And the FDA said, we'll define hyperkalemia pretty liberally. Anything above 5, 5.1 will define as hyperkalemia. And the company said, great. And so uh, this trial was just completed, and there were two strata. Either you had a potassium between 5.1 and 5.5, or you had a potassium between 5.5 and uh, 6.5. If you're above 6.5, we said you better go to dialysis. Uh, we won't touch you. Uh, but those two uh, strata were included in the trial, and they were randomized, and we looked at the changes in potassium. And in the upper strata, if you came in in the upper strata between 5.5 and 6.5, less than 6.5, and you had controlled your potassium, 
at the end of these four weeks, there was a randomized withdrawal. And what they found is there was a significant reduction in uh, potassium in the instance of hyperkalemia in the lower strata, group one, as well as the upper strata, group two. And when they withdrew uh, at the end, the people in the placebo had an increase in potassium of 0.72 milliequivalents, whereas the people who stayed on the polymer uh, just didn't have any increase in potassium at all. And uh, this is just the time cost to uh, hyperkalemia defined as a uh, potassium over 5.5, five, and you can see the people who were on the polymer in the dash line had significantly less hyperkalemia. And there was a second parallel trial uh, that George Backris was in charge of, uh, looking called Amethyst. They love to uh, pick jewels for all of their trial names. And once again, uh, there were two strata, one potassium uh, five above five, five one to five five, and the second strata. And this time, it was looking at tolerability and effectiveness over uh, a year, a total of a year. And it turned out that it was effective. You could keep the potassium down and prevent hyperkalemia uh, over the year in both the lower strata as well as the higher strata. So this has now been submitted to the FDA. And this was done under a special SPA, a special agreement with the FDA. So the anticipation is this will be approved very shortly. And I think this has great promise because this will allow us to take patients who uh, have hyperkalemia and maintain a RAS inhibitor. And now that this has been done, we've said, well, that's nice, but let's go back and see whether we can really prevent hyperkalemia. So we're now planning prevention trials, and uh, this is just the same potassium by visit. And this is a trial we're planning right now uh, that we know, I mentioned that uh, MRAs are effective in reducing mortality in people with HEFREF, uh, but they're contraindicated if you have a GFR uh, less than 30. So we're saying, okay, Let's take these very high-risk people with a GFR between 15 to 30 who paradoxically are at the highest risk and get the lowest therapy. They get hardly anything. People are afraid to give them an ACE or an AUB. They hardly get a beta blocker. And we're saying, okay, let's tackle that group, and we're going to take people with a GFR between 15 to 30, and we're then going to uh, give them a spironolactone or a plarinone and see whether... Uh, even going to higher doses than we currently use are tolerated and we can get effects. And we're going to use the, the polymer that we used in uh, the Pearl HF study where I showed you before. And the hypothesis is that if we simultaneously administer, administer uh, this polymer, patronoma or RLY5016, and an MRA such as a plan on a spiro, that will allow the use of these uh, MRAs in people with heart failure and compromised renal function with a GFR between 15 to 30. And uh, Chris uh, was at our first investigative meeting uh, last uh, July, and uh, we're having, or last September, I should say, and we've developed this protocol, which you hope to implement somewhere later this year, or early next year, where we're going to take people with heart failure reduced ejection fraction who have a GFR, as I said, between 15 to 30, and then there are going to be three arms. One, they're going to get double dummies of uh, a plarinone and the polymer and just usual care. The other will get a plarinone without the polymer, and the third group will get a plarinone with the polymer, and we're going to look at the changes in potassium, renal function, and podocyte damage, uh, and as well as BNP, troponins, and hyperkalemia. And we hope to show the combination of a plarinone and the polymer is certainly better than placebo, and likely the people who get uh, a plarinone will get hyperkalemia and will rescue them as soon as they get above 5.1. Uh, now, 
one of the interesting things here, we're going to be using uh, this assay for looking at podocyte damage. Podocytes are very sensitive to aldosterone, and they cause, aldosterone causes podocyte damage because the, the, you affect mitochondrial uh, function, dysfunction, get oxidative stress, and when you lose podocytes, you begin to drop your GFR and have renal disease. And some of my colleagues have developed this new assay for urinary podocytes, and they've studied it in renal disease. We've begun to study it in heart failure, and we're still very early, but we found that patients with heart failure have a significant elevation in podocyte damage, and now we're developing a number of protocols trying to explore this, and one of the things we're going to ask, are diuretics good or bad? When you give an intravenous diuretic and have an increase in uh, RAS activity, you get rid of volume, but is that costing you podocytes? And so this is one of the questions we're going to attempt to answer with this new assay, as well as we think this assay might predict the development of worsening renal function and chronic kidney disease and heart failure. So it's very early on, but uh, we think it has tremendous uh, potential. And uh, another aspect is that the current doses of ARBs, the current ARBs, I should say, the doses have been approved in hypertension by their effect on lowering blood pressure. But there are some studies showing if you look at doses of ARBs, and here candesartan, above approved doses for hypertension, they have renal protection and reduce albinuria. So one of the things we'd like to do in the future is to give super high doses of ARBs and see whether we can get renal protection if we're using this potassium binding polymer. And we know that in people with CKD, if you use an MRA, you can have reduction in mass and uh, you can have a reduction in albinura, you have uh, improvement in endothelial function, and we know that aldosterone plays a very important role in renal fibrosis, but when you give an MRA in people with compromised renal function, the risk is of hyperkalemia. So the hope is that we're going to do another study called uh, Alchemist. Uh, I'm sorry, this is a study that's ongoing uh, by Dr. Zanard, where they're taking people with end-stage renal disease and looking at spironolactone. But what we're going to do, let me just skip ahead, is take people who have uh, hypertension and renal disease, and we're going to give super high doses of the uh, MRAs uh, and see whether with the polymer we can protect them. And this is one of the studies we're planning in people with renal disease uh, who have a GFR between 30 and 60, and we're going to give them high doses, twice the approved doses of an ARB, to see whether we can uh, make this tolerable and have uh, renal protection. And we're also going to be looking in people with heart failure uh, and seeing whether super high doses of I shouldn't say super, but high doses of spironolactone. In the RALS trial, we used 25 to 50 milligrams. But before we did the RALS trial, there was good evidence that 100 to 200 milligrams of spironolactone overcomes diuretic resistance. And as you know, in people with ascites, are using 400 milligrams uh, safely. Uh, but in heart failure, we tend to use 25 to 50. But at those doses, there's only a minimal diuretic effect. So if you look in acute heart failure, there's nothing really that's worked in acute heart failure. And we think that the use of uh, the polymer and high doses of spironolactone may be very useful. And as a prelude to that, we're developing this diamond RAS heart failure trial where we're going to take people who have heart failure in a reduced ejection fraction, and here a GFR over 30, uh, but less than 60, for potassium less than 5, and they can have been on spiral 50 a day, as many people are, and then we're going to randomize them to usual care or to go up on the spiral to 100 to 200 milligrams a day with the polymer and see whether uh, this is tolerable 
Uh, can we avoid hyperkalemia? And most importantly, can we reduce podocyte damage, renal dysfunction, and can we reduce uh, BNP and markers of cardiac uh, damage? So these are things that we're planning uh, right now and hope by the end of the year, early next year, we will do. Now, uh, it's, I told you about heart failure, but it's been found that uh, levels of aldosterone predict events in people post-MI uh, and, and also in heart failure, but also people with coronary disease without heart failure or uh, without MI. So just coronary disease alone, a high level of aldosterone predicts events, which suggests that maybe an MRA will be very useful in coronary disease. And there is a trial in uh, infarction that just been completed, the reminder trial, where they took patients with uh, STMI. Uh, Gilles Montalesco in Paris ran this, and uh, they randomized, it turned out over 1,000 patients. They extended the study. And there was a convoluted primary endpoint of CV mortality, hospitalization, uh, and BNP. And this was very positive, but mainly due to a reduction in BNP. The event rate was very low. There's a parallel trial ongoing uh, in France as well called Albatros in NST plus STMI. And we don't know those results. But these are not definitive because of the fact that uh, it was mainly driven by BNP. But in any case, it showed the safety giving this early post-infarction. And uh, I told you about the high levels of uh, aldosterone predicting events. And uh, it also turns out that uh, aldosterone blockers improve endothelial function. Uh, and they do this uh, also in improving atherosclerosis, at least experimentally. And several of the mechanisms that are related to uh, prevention of atherosclerosis, imp improving uh, oxidative stress, uh, improving nitric oxide, uh, are all outlined here. Uh, but there have been no real studies in man, although there have been lots of studies in animals. Now, one of the other roles of aldosterone that is not uh, known very well is the adipocyte causes the release of substances that stimulate the adrenal production of aldosterone. And the adipocyte actually has aldosterone synthase and produces aldosterone. And there's a paracrine effect uh, in the perivascular fat. And uh, there have been a number of uh, animal studies looking at the role of aldosterone in obesity. And uh, aldosterone levels are elevated in obesity. And if you take animals and put them on a high-fat diet, you have an increase in mineral corticoid expression. And a low-fat diet, you have a reduction in MR activity. And very interestingly, when you stimulate the MR, and you can stimulate the MR either through aldosterone or glucocorticoids, because the, uh, glucocorticoids have a great affinity for the MR, you cause dysfunction of brown fat. Brown fat normally causes heat. But we have aldosterone, you have uncoupling, and you no longer get heat production. And in white fat, you have vascular inflammation uh, and increase in inflammatory cytokines. And it's been shown that uh, if you have obese individuals and you have them lose weight, you reduce aldosterone. And there's a Japanese study where they followed uh, people over a 10-year period. And uh, people who had aldosterone levels in the upper levels, upper two tertiles of normal, developed insulin resistance. So there seems to be an important link between the metabolic syndrome and obesity and aldosterone. And it's been shown that in people with the metabolic syndrome, when you use an aldosterone blocker, you can reduce myocardial fibrosis in these patients. And uh, it's been also shown that you can improve a endothelial function, and that improvement in endothelial function seems to be uh, related to the degree of obesity. The more visceral fat, 
you have the greater the effect of the aldosterone antagonist. And uh, similarly, you can improve uh, collagen formation and LV dysfunction. So uh, with a few people, myself, that's this, this type, and Stevo Julius and Dr. Kelsen in Norway and Eric Velasquez here, we're beginning to discuss a large-scale trial which called the Emerald Trial. What we'd like to do is use a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist not to treat heart failure, but to the prevent the development of heart failure, as well as to prevent the development of chronic renal disease and atrial fibrillation, as well as MI, stroke, and cardiovascular death in patients with the metabolic syndrome and uncontrolled hypertension. And the background for this is we know that MR expression is increased in a high-fat diet. We know that adipocytes stimulate the adrenal release of aldosterone, and high normal levels of aldosterone, I told you, are related to the development of insulin resistance. And patients with the metabolic syndrome have elevated aldosterone and or cortisol levels. And aldosterone, I said, said causes brown fat dysfunction and white fat inflammation. Aldosterone causes endothelial dysfunction, and high aldosterone levels predict events in patients with coronary artery disease without heart failure or MI. And we know that aldosterone causes vascular myocardial fibrosis and hypertrophy. It causes mesangial fibrosis, glomerular damage, protocyte loss, and albinuria, atrial fibrosis and enlargement, and AF. Yesterday, I talked about the effects of uh, Plarinone in reducing new onset AF, which we saw in our emphasis heart failure trial. And we know that aldosterone levels not only predict events in people with coronary artery disease, they predict stroke and events in people with stroke. And so we think that they have uh, blood pressure independent effects, and their MRs have been detected on macrophages, and if you block the MR on the macrophage, do an MR knockout, you prevent myocardial fibrosis and remodeling. And we know from several of our studies that they improve uh, diastolic dysfunction, reduce inflammatory markers in patients with the metabolic syndrome, they reduce oxidative stress, they reduce left atrial size and fibrosis, we think they prevent atrial fibrillation. W they reduce mesangial fibrosis, protocyte damage, so they should prevent renal disease. And we know from our studies they reduce sudden death and prevent atrial fibrillation. And they certainly have been shown, to re at least in animals, to reduce experimental myocardial and cerebral infarct size. So our hypothesis is that in patients with the metabolic syndrome who have uncontrolled hypertension, that a MRA-based strategy will be more effective than a thiazide diuretic-based strategy in the prevention of heart failure, renal disease, AF, MI, stroke, and death. And we're planning with Eric and uh, Dr. Kelson and Steve O'Julius a large-scale trial, somewhere around 15,000 patients, we believe, uh, using an open-label probe design and electronic medical uh, capture and randomization. Uh, I've been intrigued by working with the Duke group on the TRANSFORM trial with the new uh, work that you guys have done. And uh, when we've talked to the NIH, the NIH is only interested in doing trials that we can do it cheaply for about $10 a person. And uh, uh, so the only way to do this is do it open label. We can't afford to do uh, blinded trials where we have double dummies anymore. We have to rely upon the electronic medical record. and. We're developing this protocol. It's still in the early phase of development, and it may not look exactly like this when we finish. But we hope to take people, as I said, with the metabolic syndrome and have a, a GFR over 60, because we don't want to have to monitor uh, a lot of serum potassium. If you have a GFR over 60, you really don't have to worry about hyperkalemia, because the normal kidneys can handle this. So. We want to make this simple. They have to have a potassium less than 5. We take people age over 55. They will exclude people with a history of heart failure or, at or atrial fibrillation. Or we, by the GFR, we've excluded people with chronic kidney disease. And if they're uncontrolled with a blood pressure above 140 and not treated, 
they'd be randomized to an MRA versus a thiazide. And if they're on a thiazide, they would get an AUB plus a thiazide versus an MRA, and et cetera, et cetera, depending where they are. So at any level where they are, we're going to contrast a thiazide-based strategy with an MRA-based strategy in the hope that there's an advantage. We know from the thiazides, there have been studies, and I think I talked about this yesterday, with chlorthalidone. Chlorthalidone has been very useful in the SHEP trial and in all hat, but chlorthalidone causes uh, not only the activation of the RAS, but sympathetic discharge. And there's some very nice studies showing measuring direct sympathetic nerve traffic in man. When you give chlorthalidone, there's an increase in sympathetic discharge. When you add an ARB or an ACE, you don't turn that off. When you add an MRA, you block that sympathetic discharge. And you also block the effects of aldosterone. So we think there's tremendous advantages, theoretically, to contrast. Uh, right now, an MRA is third or fourth line therapy in hypertension, if at all. And we want to make it first line therapy. And so this is our attempt, whether we'll ever get funded in this new world uh, remains to be seen, but we think with your help with the electronic medical records and the transform trial that we're working on with tosamide versus furosemide, we're only going to take centers in the U.S. who have the EPIC system. But in this trial, this is a challenge. We want to go internationally and combine several different electronic medical systems. So we think this would be a challenge, but also a tremendous opportunity for the future to really learn how to do these big trials uh, efficiently and cheaply. So uh, this is what we're up to. I also say a few words about hypokalemia. We know we get hyperkalemia with uh, MRAs, but we also prevent hypokalemia. And we know from some of our studies that even a serum potassium less than four, everyone talks about 3.5, but less than four, is associated with an increase in mortality. And we've looked even between 3.5 and 4, and we found an increase in mortality. So in heart failure, if you have a K less than 4, that's an increased risk. And we've looked at our patients with renal disease and the relationship between potassium and uh, death. And of course, we found people who have an elevated potassium had an increase in mortality. But what was striking in these people with renal disease, it was even steeper on the downside. No one was paying attention to hypokalemia. And below four, we have a very steep increase in death because no one's paying attention down there. Everyone's worried about hyperkalemia. And so we think hypokalemia is a tremendous challenge. And we're postulating that it may be better to treat hypokalemia with an MRA than with a potassium supplement. And we're beginning to work on a trial with Dr. Zanad and Mosinol in France where we compare a, a potassium supplement strategy to a MRA-based strategy. And this is very early in planning, but we're planning to take people of a history of hypertension, not heart failure, because heart failure, there's an indication for an MRA where there's no MRA indication in hypertension uh, early on, and take people with potassium less than 4 who have a GFR greater than 15, and to randomize them to spironolactone or potassium supplement, and then look at cardiovascular death and hospitalization. And we believe that having the MRA will give you much more than raising potassium, also raises intracellular magnesium, has antifibrotic and target organ effects, and we think will be much better, but this is something obviously has to be proved. So just to conclude, we think we've already shown tremendous benefit of MRAs in systolic heart failure. We think we've shown some benefit in diastolic heart failure. That's in the eye of the beholder. Uh, but there's a tremendous opportunity in the future, we believe, uh, for MRAs in hypertension, chronic renal disease, atherosclerosis, the metabolic syndrome, cerebral vascular disease, as well as ventricular arrhythmias. So we think we're just at the beginning of this era, not at the end. And whether we can 
go down this pathway will depend upon the NIH and funding and whether people have patents uh, and maybe your help with the electronic medical records. So I look forward to working with you and I think anyone here is interested, we'd love to work with you. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Pitt. <clears throat> really an excellent talk, I think, leading us through the history of of the therapies and uh, reduced ejection fraction and then where you're extending that and further refining that over time. So thank you. We'll open it up for questions. That said, this is a, a great talk and actually an incredible um, example for the, the fellows here of focus. Um, uh, but you know, one question I have for you is uh, you highlighted a little bit about some of the challenges when industry is there supporting um, development and then when it pulls back. Um, you know, what do you think are the solutions for that? Because you also mentioned NIH is also pulling back and, and, and they've invested um, monies in trials, but sometimes it takes a, a long time. Well, I wish I knew the answer to that, but I don't. Uh, we often wish that the patent life was a little longer than it is. Uh, given the long time it takes to develop things, by the time you get through the, the first major phase three trial and develop things, and then you start thinking of things you want to do, uh, the clock is ticked, and then people look at the business plan and say, well, I have five years left to go or something, and no one's willing to invest. And then uh, during that period, uh, you can do little things, and then you're stuck going to governments, and uh, governments are getting tougher and tougher. So I wish I knew the answer to that. Uh, but I don't. But, and, I, and I don't think that patent law will change very soon because of the tremendous pressures on cost and generic drugs. So uh, I hope you have an answer, uh, but I don't. Bert, uh, a great review. And I, just to follow up on a a Adrian's uh, comments, and that is <coughs> you sort of have nicely set up um, whether the kidney or the heart is more important in heart failure by, uh, by studying these new generation MRAs which are more cardiac specific and yet um, great for society and patients but bad for you as a trialist. You set such a high bar with spironolactone and aplerinone showing these major signals on morbidity and mortality. Uh, the likelihood that these new generation MRAs are going to be able to beat a player in a spir uh, spironolactone well, is going to be hard. And well, so that's why Bayer is going very cautiously. They, they beat spironolactone, they, they think. Uh, can they beat a plerinone? We're seeing right now. Uh, we think we might. Uh, we certainly think with a new drug delivery system, if it ever gets to man, where we get it just in the heart or just in the macrophages, we could do it. Uh, but you know, well, I challenge. think th these are important questions because it also answers the question whether the heart or the kidney is more important. But what what the challenge you've put up in this talk is that you've outlined about uh, 20 important clinical trials and 100,000 patients to be recruited. And how do we get there? And I think what you've alluded to nicely with uh, um, the hypertension trial design and transform is that we need your advocacy at the FDA, you've done it at the NIH, but with the drug companies to say, it's acceptable to do a phase three trial that's a very simple trial using mortality as an endpoint, EMRs, not 100% monitoring, not all the 3,000 page case report form. It's and gonna take a, a tough sell because there's still a lot of resistance to this, but I think that's where it's going. The dollars are just not there. So we have to be innovative. That's why I'm delighted to be here and to working with you guys on Transform and I hope on the Emerald uh, trial and hypertension if that ever comes to fruition. I mean, it's the only way we're going to be able to do these comparative, active comparative trials. Adoption of your uh, treatment into routine clinical practice, this is not the first time you've heard this, must be somewhat frustrating to you. Well, some of your friends uh, uh, have contributed to that doubt. But, uh. <laughs> <laughs> not me, not me, no, 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 not my friends. The, the, the question though is, is how, how could we do better? I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a believer 
um, how could we do better in terms of getting adoption of this agent? Well, it, you know, getting adoption of anything is, is difficult. When you look back at the statin trials, uh, it was amazing to me after all those large-scale trials how many years it took to get to be more than 50% of appropriate people. I was the PI of the Seoul trial, and it took us almost a, a decade uh, to get to about 85, 90% of uh, ACE use. And so nothing comes easily. And I honestly don't understand why it takes so long. You guys may understand it a lot better. But it, it just takes a long time for people to do these things. And uh, I don't know. And I think if the drug companies understood this, uh, they've been certainly trying. Uh, but they haven't understood it either, because uh, they've certainly been trying. And not only takes a long time for people to get to use it, but once they start using it, they stop using it very quickly. So uh, I just don't know what's going on. And hopefully, with your outcome studies, you guys can tell me what's going on, because I don't understand it. Uh, fantastic talk. Uh, and coming from, from Europe, we have the same issues. And within the European Society of Cardiology, I've actually tried to promote uh, towards the EU Parliament a different way of looking at this patent loss. And I think that's the way to go. Instead of having it a shot on, shot off after 10 yeah. years. I, it uh, sounds good, but I think that the political pressures are such, and the generic drugs are, are so tempting uh, the costs that, uh, although it makes sense to us, I think it's a tough sell. I, I it's hope a tough it's sell, successful. but it should be a gradual. Yeah, I, and I, after 10 I, years, I you could actually to join take you in any part way. of it and go it into a public I think funding. that's where we should go. And you look at it rationally, that's where we should go. But I think it's going to be a very tough sell. Great. Well, please okay. join me again in thanking Dr. Okay, Pitt thank for an you. excellent talk.